Hi, I'd like to welcome you as we continue in our stu study of the book of Exodus, this wonderful book that God's given to us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for being our teacher. Lord, thank you so much for having Moses write this book, this history. And now, Lord, we as your students come to you and ask you to teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to read now the few verses that we're going to be considering today. And that would be the last verse in chapter 1 of Exodus and the first three verses of chapter 2. So I'll start now in the last verse, verse 22 of chapter 1 of Exodus. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, or brink, by the river's brink. Okay, now, in our last study, you remember, we saw how great was the significance of Moses' statement about himself that we're going to use as a guide verse as we study the history of Moses, and that's the verse that's found in Deuteronomy 18.15, which reads, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Those three words that Moses said about the Lord Jesus Christ are very important. He said that the Lord Jesus Christ would be like unto Moses, like unto me. And it gives us now, that's the guide, that gives us the study book, this gives us the, the direction that we're going to use as we study the life of Moses. So when we study the life of Moses, our path is going to follow one direction, one question that we're going to be asking as we look at the life of Moses, and that question is this, in what way or in what ways was Moses like unto the Lord Jesus Christ? No other character in the Old Testament said that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, was like unto him. Only Moses, only one who did that. That's the reason why Moses is the greatest character in the Old Testament because he's the only one in the Old Testament who said that the Lord Jesus Christ was like unto him. Now, in our last study, we looked at kind of an overview, and we saw many ways in which Moses was like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to continue to see many more ways as we study the life of Moses. There are two verses that describe to us the two very, very important aspects of the life of, the, of, of Moses. There is these two verses describe for us the personal private life of Moses and the public life of Moses. And we need to, we need to, to not only study and to see how he is like unto the Lord Jesus Christ, but these, these two verses provide for us, in, in the example of Moses, a challenge for us, a pattern for us, something that we should emulate, something that we should be like, and is very, very important. Now, first the verse that describes the secret personal life of Moses, and that's found in Exodus 33, 11. Very, very important where it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Let me repeat that. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Moses had a very, very important private life with God. Moses had a, the, the essential, the essentiality, you might say, in Moses' life was his personal private life with God. It was an unseen life with God. It was a secret life with God. It was a secret that really defined who Moses was. What made Moses the great man of God that he was? 
The answer is, it was his secret life with God. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to be a man of God. We want to be a woman of God. We want to be people of God. And the big question is, what is the secret to being a man of God? What is the secret to being a woman of God? And the answer is what we are reading here in this verse about Moses. It's the secret life with God. What do we learn about this secret life with God that Moses had? One word, friend. That word, friend, that, the, in Exodus 33, 11, last word, friend, friend. Moses was a friend of God. Moses had friendship with God. That was Moses' secret. That was a secret in Moses' life. He was a friend of God. He had friendship with God. And how did this friendship manifest itself? The Lord spake unto Moses face to face, face to face. If you were to say to Moses, Moses, are you a friend of God? Yes, he would say, without hesitation, I am a friend of God. Moses, how does your friendship with God manifest itself? He would say, God and me, we speak with perfect transparency, face to face, hiding nothing from each other. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this type of friendship and this face to face uh, transparency here, the speaking, the communication of it all. He said in John 6, 30, 663, he said this, the Lord Jesus Christ said this to his friends when he said, it is the spirit that quickeneth or that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Moses, what is the essentiality of your friendship with God? The communication that we have together, Moses would say. The talking, he talks to me, I talk to him. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying in John 6, 63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In John 15, 15, the Lord Jesus Christ is, is speaking about this open communication and he says, I call, henceforth, I call you not servants. Now, let's stop here. He's going to now describe why he does not call us servants. And he's going to tell a characteristic of a servant. And he's going to, when he tell, does that, he's doing it because he wants us to know that that's not the way he's dealing with us. Here's what he says. Henceforth I call you not servants, John 15, 15. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. I have made known unto you. You see? He's saying here, I'm not calling you a servant because a servant, he doesn't need an explanation for why. He just needs the orders to do. But he's saying, that's not my relationship with you. My relationship with you is friend to friend. Now keep in mind that this person who is speaking here, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Jehovah Jesus in the Old Testament that Moses was speaking to, of which it says, as we saw in Exodus 33, 11, that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so now we have the same person in John 15, 15, explaining to us, he could have stepped right out of the pages of Exodus 33 over here to the page of John 15, 15, and he says, I don't, I, I, henceforth I call you not servants, because a servant doesn't know what his, his Lord doeth. I've called you friends before all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto, known unto you. So the essentiality of this friendship between Moses and God was the communication a communication. Moses spoke to God. God spoke to Moses, and that's what he's referring to here. Here was Moses. Now, when we see this private life of Moses, this is the Moses who is out of sight. He's not within our, he, he can't be seen. He's in a secret place. This is the Moses that's in a secret place. This is the Moses that's meeting with God. This is the Moses that God is speaking to. And there's another place, which is, goes along with Exodus 33, 11, which can, it describes the secret life with, 
between Moses and God, and that's in Numbers 12, 7 through 8. Numbers 12, 7 through 8. And this is where God is standing up for his friend Moses. He is defending his friend Moses to those who, who doubted his authority. And he says, God speaks about Moses. He says, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? There's no other person in the Bible, in the scriptures, who God said that he spoke to mouth to mouth, mouth to mouth. And when that verse says that he speaks apparently and that the similitude, similitude shall he behold, it means that Moses saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses saw, is what it means when he says, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. He saw the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so we put this all together and we have Exodus 33, 11 speaking about the private life of Moses and God. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And then God said that he is, so this is the place where, as we said, God speaks to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. Now, these are the phrases that really characterize the private life that Moses had with God. God and Moses had a communication that was so close that it was called a mouth-to-mouth -mouth communication. God and Moses had a transparency with each other that was so close that it was called a face-to-face -face relationship. God and Moses had a relationship that was, the only way you could call this relationship was friend-to-friend. Mouth-to-mouth, face-to-face, friend-to-friend. Three phrases that describe Moses' secret life. Mouth to mouth, face to face, friend to friend. That's the secret life that Moses had with God. That's the secret that Moses had. That's the secret of Moses. No one saw that life that Moses had with God, but God saw it, and that life defined who Moses was. When Moses spoke to the people, <coughs> people would say, you know what? There's a man who speaks to God mouth to mouth, face to face, friend to friend. Now the other great verse about Moses is the one that describes the other side of Moses, which is his public life or his seen life. And that verse is in Exodus 3.14. That's the verse where Moses is at the burning bush and God said unto Moses, after Moses had asked, well, who are you or who should I say has sent me? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, and he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So publicly, Moses was known as the man who was sent by God. Moses was sent by the great I am to Israel to be their deliverer, to be their savior. So the verse that describes Moses' personal secret life, those verses, Numbers 12, 7 through 8, and Exodus 33, 11, where we saw the... God speaking to him mouth to mouth, face to face, friend to friend. This is the verse that describes his public life, Exodus 3.14, and that's a verse that describes that Moses was sent by God. Now, from the last verse that we've read in chapter 1, we saw the, 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 the time that surrounded the birth of Moses. If we were to characterize this time, we would say this was a desperate time for the Jewish people. We look at Moses, we understand this is their deliverer. Moses is their deliverer, and he's been born into a time of absolute desperacy among the Jewish people, Exodus 1.22 that we read. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. This verse just gives us a crystal clear picture of the time that surrounded Moses' birth. It was a time of the deepest need for Israel. We can't imagine how deep this need was in the life of the Jewish people in, in, in Israel at that time. It was a time of just um, unbearable hopelessness 
for Israel. This was a time when there was, when Israel looked at themselves and they said, there is no way that we can get ourselves out of this trouble. There is no help for us in ourselves, no help for us in ourselves. And to the Jewish people, it just had appeared that God had forgotten and forsaken them. And they were looking at the face of their own annihilation. And it was precisely at this time in Israel's history, it was at this time in the, in the depth of Israel's hopelessness, it was at this time in the depth of Israel's uh, despair that precisely it's at this time that God sent his deliverer named Moses. That was exactly the same situation at the time when God sent the great deliverer, his Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a time of extreme Roman oppression. The Jewish people were under the heel of the Romans and they felt that hopelessness. It was just during that time when God decided to implement the John 3, 16 through 17. God so loved the world that he gave or he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Now we've seen that in the life of Moses. We saw that at the, at the coming of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and looking into the spyglass of the future for the Jewish people, there is coming, we understand from the scriptures, another time when the Jewish people will again face an utter hopeless situation, when it will appear again that they are on the brink of annihilation, when they will say there is no way that we can get ourselves out of this situation. There is no hope, no help for us. That's the time that has a specific name that is called for the time period, and I'll read it to you, which is Jeremiah 37 through 11. Alas, for that great day, <clears throat> so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, shall be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I, will, I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. This time period is called, as we've seen here in Jeremiah, the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah tells us that this time period is unprecedented and that, and he uses these words, the prophet Jeremiah uses these words, there is none like it. Looking back over the history of the Jewish people, he said there is none like it. And oh, when we look back over the history of the Jewish people, only have to consider World War II, the, the, the Nazis, the concentration camps, and et cetera, et cetera. And this says there's none like to it. It makes us dizzy to think about it. This will be a time that's worse than the scene that we have and we're studying right now in Exodus 1. It's the time when the prophet Zechariah spoke about, when he said in Zechariah 14, 2 through 3, when he said, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. You know, it's kind of interesting when you look back over uh, our so-called world wars that we've had. World War I, World War II. 
In October 24, 1945, after World War II, the United Nations was born, and it was born with the same goal as the League of Nations after World War I, and that was to prevent another world war. Now, we all know that after World War I, it wasn't called World War I when it happened, it was just called the World War because there was never expected to be another one, but after that World War, the League of Nations that, that, that uh, had formed after that World War, it failed with the start of World War II. And now we have the United Nations. It's an organization with the goal of, once again, having all the, wor the nations of the world unite to prevent war. And so what we have in this verse in Zechariah 14.2 is the pinnacle of the United Nations. The United Nations has had their debates. When we, when we come to Zechariah 14.2, we can say the United Nations has had their debates. The United Nations has formed their resolutions. They have collected their signatures. And now every nation, that's what it says, all nations, every nation has agreed that they have identified that there's one singular threat to world peace. There is one singular threat to entering into another world war, and that singular threat is the nation of Israel. It is the homeland for the Jewish people. This is what the nations have come to the conclusion, the United Nations. So in Zechariah 14.2, when it says all nations to battle against Jerusalem, that's the pinnacle of the United Nations. All nations are now united in their, their agreement that the problem is the Jewish people, the problem is Israel, and, they must, and they've come to fight. Well, if Zechariah 14.2 is the pinnacle of the United Nations, the next verse, Zechariah 14.3, is the end of the United Nations, and that's described with these words, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. So just like the time when Moses was born, it will be, in this coming time, a time for the Jewish people of absolute hopelessness, absolute despair, the brink of annihilation. No way for the Jewish people to get themselves out of this. No way for the Jewish people to help themselves. No way for the Jewish people to save themselves. That's the time when God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come with the words of Jeremiah 30.10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar. And, it is, and coming from heaven is from afar. Now, we come now and we look at the first verse in Exodus 2. And that's kind of an interesting verse. It's interesting from a number of points of view. But one of them, when you read it, it says, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. Well, in those verses, we have for us the introduction of the parents of Moses. Moses, the great deliverer of Israel, the great deliverer of the Jewish people. And here we have the description of the parents of this great deliverer of the Jewish people. And, it's simp and, and the father is introduced to us simply called a man of the house of Levi. And the mother is simply called a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the description which is given to us is that the man took to wife a daughter of Levi. So their marriage was not with any great pomp and ceremony. It just, it just he took her. It's a very simple way to get married. If we did that today, then think of how much money everybody could save on the wedding ceremonies and so forth. But that's what it says. They took to wife, daughter of Levi. Very, very simple. Now, these descriptions of the parents of the greatest deliverer of the, of the Jewish people in the Old Testament are not exactly uh, descriptions of anyone great or special among the Jewish people. The parents of Moses, the great deliverer, are not described as ruling elders, because there were elders. We know that Moses went later on and met with them. They're not described as rabbis of the Jewish people. There's no prominence at all in the description about the parents of Moses. The father is just described as a man of the house of Levi, and the mother is described as a daughter of Levi. 
just common, everyday, run-of-the-mill commoners among the Jewish people. Yet from these commoners emerges the greatest deliverer of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, Moses. Now, Moses used, again, as we started off, those very interesting words uh, in, in Deuteronomy 18.15, and let's look again, Deuteronomy 18.15, to describe how he was like the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him she shall hearken. He said to the Jewish people, Moses said to the Jewish people that the Lord Jesus Christ would be, and here's the phrase, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. With this description, Moses, this description, Moses is describing his parents, his lineage, his, his pedigree. He was from the midst of the Jewish people, of the Jewish people. That's the description that Moses told the Jewish people, look for that. That's your clue. That's how you're going to identify the Messiah that, the, that God is going to send. That's how you're going to identify the Lord Jesus Christ because he would be like Moses in terms of where he came from, right out of the center of the common cloth of the Jewish people, parents with no special pedigree. The New Testament describes the parents of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 12, Luke 1, 27, it says, a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she described her own position within Israel, within the Jewish people, among the Jewish people, with two words. And she used these words in Luke 1.48 when she was speaking about herself and she said, For God, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. That's the description she gave of her pedigree. It was low estate. She knew that she did not come from an impressive family line. The fact that the mother, Mary, and the stepfather, Joseph, were so common among the Jewish people was a point that the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ made an issue when they said about him in Mark 6.3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Why were they offended at him? They were offended at him because of his background. He was just a carpenter. He was only the son of Mary. He didn't come from any elite family in Israel. So the very clue that Moses gave to the Jewish people of how they were to recognize their God-sent deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would come right out of the common stock of the Jewish people, that in that way he would be just like Moses, that very clue was the reason that they rejected him. And the Lord Jesus Christ knew this and the word that he used to describe how they felt about him was given in John 15, 18. He said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me. So the word that he uses is hatred. Now, there's also something very interesting about the second verse of uh, Exodus 2. Very interesting. It says, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. When Moses' mother gave birth to Moses, she saw something in Moses. We're not told all the details, but we are, but it, it, but there's a phrase in there, and we don't know exactly what she saw, but what it says is that she saw him that he was a goodly child. We're not sure what that means, and we're not sure what she saw. But when it says she saw him that he was a goodly child, there's something very significant in those words. Because what did she see? This is the question. What did she see? What did she recognize when she called Moses a goodly child? She saw a certain uniqueness in Moses. Now, I know 
that every Jewish mother looks at her kid and says, he's a genius, he's above average, but that's not what we're talking about here. He, this is, this is, she's not saying he's exceptionally cute as a baby. What Moses' mother observed about Moses when she called him a goodly child is picked up on in two places in the New Testament. First, when Stephen was giving his speech on the history of Israel, which were his last words before he was killed, he said in Acts 7.20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Stephen said that what Moses' mother called a goodly child, he called he was exceeding fair. Now, and then this, the other place where it's picked up on the New Testament is in the great hall of fame of those who acted by faith. Moses' parents are recorded in Hebrews 11:23, where it says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. In this verse, they called the hiding of Moses an act of faith and they said that they hid Moses because they saw that he was a proper child. So what do all these descriptions mean? What are we to make them? We put them all together and we see in Exodus 2.2, she saw him that he was a goodly child. We see in Exodus Acts 7.20, he was exceeding fair. We see in Hebrews 11.23, they saw he was a proper child child. And very important in Hebrews 11:23 that when they hid him, they described it as by faith. It was an act of faith. When his parents hid Moses, it was an act of faith. Why was it an act of faith for his parents to hide him? It was an act of faith because they knew that God was going to do a great work through their son Moses, because that's why it's called the act of faith. By faith, it says in Hebrews 11, 23, and it talks about them hiding it, and it also says that they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Why were they not afraid of the king's commandment? Because they knew that God was greater than the king, and God's commandment was more important than the king's commandment. And they took the position of Peter when he was told not to speak anymore in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he responded to the tribunal in Acts 5.29 where it says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And this is not just two parents not just the parents, of Mo, the parents of Moses are not just two parents trying to save their baby like any parents would try to do. Something more than this. These are two parents whom God has revealed something to. And this is what's indicated by when she said he was, saw he was a goodly child and exceeding fair and, and, and so forth. He was that they knew God was going to use their baby for a great work of God, and they were to obey God and hide this baby. And we know this was not easy. That we know there were Egyptian searchers who were constantly going through the Jewish homes in search of the new babies that they might take and drown them in the River Nile. This was not easy for Moses' parents. And we can, all, we can just imagine the lookouts that there were for the Egyptian searchers who were coming, the unexpected intrusions in the home, the ramshacking of the house and all the stuff, searching and searching and searching for the babies, the anxieties in the home over whether the baby was going to make a peep during those searchings. And, and, and it, it, was, it was bad. Finally, it got to be, as we're going to see here in, in verse 3, and when she could no longer hide him, it got to be too much. But we don't know if the parents of Moses knew the great work or the extent of the great work that God was going to do through their baby Moses. So we can't be totally sure. But I think Moses' parents recognized that their newborn baby was Israel's deliverer. Because after all, God did reveal to both Mary and Joseph that God was going to 
to do a great work through their baby Jesus, who was the great deliverer, the Son of God. And if that's true, then we can ask the question, who in Israel recognized that when Moses was born, there was born Israel's deliverer? No one in Israel knew, except maybe his parents, that the deliverer of Israel had been born. Certainly the Jewish people who were desperate for God's Savior, desperate for God's deliverer, had no idea that when Moses was born, their deliverer had been born. Who knew who he was when Moses was born? At that time, a very small handful of people, maybe his family. The birth of God's deliverer of Israel was a secret. The Jewish people were ignorant of the birth of their deliverer. If they knew he was born, to them, he wasn't anything special. He was just another Jewish boy born in the land of Goshen. Now here again, we can't help but see how the Lord Jesus Christ is like unto Moses. We see this. In his birth, who knew when the Lord Jesus Christ was born? In Luke 2, 7, through 12, it reads like this. And she brought forth her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there was in the same field shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ, or the Messiah, the Lord. And this shall be the sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Who knew when God's deliverer of Israel, the Messiah, was born? Shepherds, small handful of shepherds. Mary, Joseph, who knew who he was when the Lord Jesus Christ was born? A small handful of some shepherds and Mary and Joseph. The birth of God's sent Messiah, the Deliverer, was a secret, just like Moses. The Jewish people were ignorant of the birth of their Deliverer. If they knew, and maybe, the, of course, the innkeeper knew, if they knew, they just said, it's just another Jewish baby boy born in Bethlehem. So just as Moses' birth as a Deliverer of the Jewish people of Israel was a secret to the Jewish people who desperately needed him. So the birth of God's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, was a secret to the Jewish people who desperately needed him. Israel's ignorance that their deliverer had been born was not just for the time when Moses was born, but from the time of Moses' birth, going through the next 40 years of Moses' life as he as he was being raised in the royal palace, Israel continued in their ignorance that Moses was their deliverer. All during those 40 years when Moses was in the royal palace and they didn't know who he was, all during those 40 years, Jewish babies continued to be born. They continued to be drowned in the Nile River. And all during that time, Israel is ignorant that their deliverer has been born and Moses is their deliverer. And then the next 40 years in Moses' life, as we're going to see, when Moses was in exile out of Egypt, another 40 years passes by while Moses will be in the land of Midian. And during those next 40 years, Jewish babies continue to be born and they continue to be drowned in the Nile. And Israel continues to be ignorant that their deliverer has been born and Moses is their deliverer. Now, during the first 40 years when Moses was in the royal palace and Jewish babies were floating dead down the Nile River, did any Jewish person apart from the family know that Moses the Deliverer had been born? During the second 40 years when Moses was in Midian and the Jewish babies were again floating down dead in the Nile, did any Jewish person apart from this family know that Moses the Deliverer had been born? And during those second 40 years, when Moses was in Midian 
and Nile crocodiles fed on Jewish baby boys. Did any Jewish person know that Moses was going to return to save the Jewish people? And throughout the centuries, when the Jewish people have been slaughtered by the Romans, by the Spaniards in the Inquisition, by the Russians in the pogroms, by the Nazis, did any Jewish person know that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Deliverer, had been born? Throughout the centuries, when the Lord Jesus Christ has left the land of Egypt, the uh, land of Israel, in the resurrection, and is now in heaven, and he's been there for for 2,000 years, and the Jewish people continue to be murdered. Did any Jewish person know that the Lord Jesus Christ, their deliverer, is going to return to save the Jewish people? Do any of the Jewish people today know that the Lord Jesus Christ, like Moses, is going to return to save the Jewish people? Only a very small handful. What the Bible calls in Isaiah 1.9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. That's the description, a very small remnant, relatively none of the Jewish people know. Now, although, and we want to continue to think about Moses' family now. Although it says in Hebrews 11.23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months in his parents, uh, three months of his parents, it, which when you read that verse in Hebrews 11:23, it gives credit to Moses' mother and father for acting by faith. See, that's what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. By faith, hid of his parents. It's giving credit to both Moses' mother and Moses' father by acting in faith and obedience to God to, uh, to hide the baby. But Exodus 2.2 2 doesn't paint... Uh, doesn't exactly say it that way. It paints a little, uh, uh, it, let, let's just put it this way. Exodus 2.2 gives us an insight into what's happening. Exodus 2.2 says, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. See, in this verse, it says that Moses' mother, which, by the way, in the other parts of scriptures, we know that her name is Jochebed. So this is, and we know his father's name is Amram. So Jochebed is the one who is identified as making the decision to hide Moses. That's in, in Exodus 2.2. 2. But just what's so beautiful for us and what really comes out as a beautiful teaching is that when you blend Exodus 2.2, where we see that Moses' mother, Jochebed, made the decision to hide Moses. You blend that verse with Hebrews 11.23, where we see that both Moses' mother and father made the decision to hide Moses. And it teaches us an important truth. You know, this is the truth it teaches us. It's no good in a marriage if one of the spouses is making serious decisions without the consent and agreement of the other spouse. It's no good in a marriage if a wife is making serious decisions regardless of whether or not her husband agrees. It's no good in a marriage if a husband is making serious decisions regardless of whether or not his wife agrees. So when we read in Exodus 2.2 and see that it's Moses' mother that made the serious decision to hide Moses, we worried about their marriage. We worried about their home because it appears that mom is making the serious decision in Exodus 2.2, and we wonder, what about dad? Where's dad? That's why Hebrews 11.23 is so important to blend with Exodus 2.2 because in Hebrews 11.23, we learn that dad was in perfect agreement with mom who seemed to have taken the initiative. Mom took the initiative and dad was in perfect agreement. Thank God for those three words in Hebrews 11.23 where it says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. <clears throat> because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Those are very important three words that we don't get in Hebrews 2.2, 2, and those important words are of his parents. As a general rule, it's okay for either mom or dad to take the initiative as long as mom or dad has the agreement of the other. You know, on January 17th in 2013, Cheryl and I celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary. And if you were to ask me 
What is it that I appreciate the most about my wife? I would tell you. It's how God speaks through her and works through her, not only in my salvation, but through these 43 years, God has greatly used my wife to help me. Some couples, they fight so much that you wonder that when they get to heaven and they're not going to be married anymore, are they going to be friends? And well, I can tell you, when we get to heaven, I'm going to be friends with my wife. Because Peter said something very important about marriage in 1 Peter 3, 7. He said, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. I give honor to my wife as a person through whom God speaks, through whom God acts. And when Amram, the, Moses' father, saw Jochebed, his wife, when he saw her take the initiative to hide Moses, Amram recognized that his wife Jochebed was on God's page. And Amram joined Jochebed on God's page. It wasn't a case of being Jochebed's page. It was God's page. And it takes humility in a marriage for one to realize that the other is on God's page and the need is to get together and be on God's page. And let me say this to husbands. It takes humilities. It takes humility for us as husbands to realize when our wives are on God's page and we are not. And that's what happened here in the case of, of Amram and Jochebed. And the issue is not getting on our wives' page. The issue is getting on God's page. And here we have before us in Exodus 2.2 and 2 Hebrews 11.23 an example of a good man, Amram, Amram, because he did not act like a stubborn mule and say, I'm the head of this house and what I say goes. And men, even in spiritual matters, sometimes we are wrong and our wives are right. And the issue for us has to be being right not preserving our regality in the home. That's, why, that's what Peter meant when he said in 1 Peter 3, 7, that husbands and wives are to be heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. That's a very dangerous threat. I don't, there's no way I want my prayers to be hindered. And there's no way any of us want our prayers to be hindered. And men, if that means eating some humble pie and acknowledge that our wives were right and to follow on in their initiative, as Amram did with Jochebed, I'd rather do that than to have my prayers hindered. And by the way, in 1 Peter 3, 7, when it does say that your prayers be not hindered, we can imagine that Jochebed and Amram were praying together over hiding Moses. That is a very precious scene for us. There we see in our mind's eye Jochebed and Amram, their homes at any minute, day or night, even when they're sleeping, they might be broken into and their stuff turned upside down. And hiding their baby was scary. He might cry at the wrong time. And their very lives were at risk for not obeying the order of the Pharaoh. And no idea how they were going to assure that their baby boy Moses was going to live. So they're filled with all these uncertainties and these anxieties. How do they keep their sanity in such pressure? And we imagine this dear couple on their knees together with specific prayers for God, meeting at the throne of God's grace, asking God to do the impossible and praising God for having chosen them as part of his great plan to deliver the Jewish people. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for recording these histories for us that we might benefit, that we might grow. Lord, continue to teach us lessons that we might please you. In Jesus' name, amen.